going into that rehearsal room and hearing for the first time the, the scale of the, the sound and the, the depth and the texture of the orchestra was just fabulous. But also to be doing it in front of an audience where we'll be able to capture, I hope, the thrill of, of the live experience, the delight of an audience hearing this for the first time. To have them actually in the studio with the orchestra and the actors is going to be quite something. The trouble with editing audio diaries is deciding where to begin. We know now it started four years ago, though nobody realised it at the time. This was still our world, and we were on our honeymoon, Phyllis and me, a romantic Arctic cruise to see the Northern Lights. Oh. Should we go back inside? Do you know what to hang on in case they start up again? I know I sound childish, but there's a limit to how much natural majesty I can take. But we'll never get another chance like this. The sky's so clear. Look how red Mars is tonight. I don't want to worry you, but if that's Mars, it seems to be on a collision course with us. You know, it's just a trick of the light. Mike, there's two of them. That can't be right. There's three of them. It must be some sort of aircraft. Well, I've never seen a plane that looks like a baby comet. There's five of them. They're going right over us. They're losing height. They're going to hit the water. <laughs> what the heck was that? I <gasps> don't no idea. But it looks like a nice exclusive package for the Today programme to me. We're supposed to be on our honeymoon. We can't spend the whole time in bed, Mike. And I've reached saturation point with the Northern Lights, a little light programme making. It's just what we need. And the time is 8.37. We're going over now to our correspondent, Mike Watson, in the Arctic Circle for a report of things that go fizz in the night. I don't suppose there's much to see up there, Mike? Lots of stars, of course. Uh, the Northern Lights, if you're lucky. But last night, 400 miles west of the Norwegian coast, we looked up and saw something that took our breath away. Out of the sky, five spheres appeared. They had a solid red center surrounded by a fuzzy scarlet halo like a bright red spotlight seen through a fog, except there was no fog. That sounds alarming. How big were these fireballs? They looked about the size of hot air balloons. At first we thought they were heading straight for our ship, but they passed overhead in a long glide till they hit the sea with a loud hiss, like water hitting a giant frying pan, followed by a plume of pink steam. And then they were gone without a trace. And you've no idea what these fireballs were? No, and none of the crew were willing to speculate, although one officer admitted he'd heard of something similar in the mid-Atlantic. So, there we have it. Another maritime mystery. Later, in our cabin, we discovered we'd kicked a hornet's nest. Your Twitter feed's going mad. 
Hashtag fireballs is trending worldwide. UFO nutters, I did tell you. Uh, I don't think they're all nutters, Mike. There's a lot of tweeters claiming they've seen fireballs just like ours over the sea. Long arcs ending up in a steamy splashdown. Copycats, then? No, no, look, there's some here with photos. Let's have a look. Oh, that could be anything. A brake light on a foggy night. But there's no fog. The rest of the sky is clear. Come on, Phil. You know the days of cameras that don't lie are long behind them? Well, I'm going back out on deck tonight with a camera. And she did, that night and the three remaining nights of the cruise, which wasn't how I'd been expecting to spend the rest of our honeymoon, if I'm honest. By the time we got home, the whole world had gone fireball crazy. Oh, it's so lovely to be back in our own kitchen. I'm not good at being waited on hand and foot. No, you like being your own boss too much. <laughs> We've only been gone a fortnight. Look at this pile of mail. I thought digital media was supposed to reduce paper. The fireballs are all over the papers too. Thirteen off Finland, a dozen near Havana in the middle of the day, almost forty scattered north of Russia. Oh, some spectacular pics from the middle of the Pacific. The Americans had a crack at blaming Putin, but he's doing his usual outraged routine. But surely if it was the Russians, they wouldn't be reporting sightings off their own coast. And since when has logic ever troubled our press? Still, it is all getting a bit edgy. There's one for you here, handwritten. Oh, must be a party invitation. Oh, no. It's from Denzel Davis. You remember Denzel? Denzel Davis from the Valleys. <laughs> the best scrum off this university he's ever had, look you. Just because he once asked me out. Punching way above his weight. <laughs> what does Denzel want? Mm. Wants to meet up. Oh, very cloak and dagger. You always did make a lovely cup of fill. <clears throat> you didn't come round because I brew a decent cup of tea, Denzel. Very astute of you. Although, of course, I'm not really here. Nothing I say has actually been said. Would well, you want to talk to us off the record? I'm attached to the MOD these days, and I've got some information I think the public should know. I don't really cover defence, Denzel. I can put you in touch. It's not really defence, as such. I thought of you two because you're the nearest thing to fireball experts in the media. <laughs> Well, you've got some information about the fireballs. They're making everybody very twitchy. The Americans blame the Russians, the Russians blame the Chinese, the Chinese blame the Japanese, the North Koreans blame everyone, and so it goes on. All it takes is one overreaction, and Syria starts to look like a playground fight. But there's no suggestion that they're some kind of weapon, is there? Nobody's under attack from things that go fizz in the middle of the ocean. Nobody knows for certain. And politicians are bore a vacuum. They're always on the lookout for ways to settle old scores. That's how Iraq got trashed the second time around. So, the story that hasn't surfaced yet is that there have been several engagements with the fireballs. By engagements, you mean we've taken them on? Taken them out, more like. As far as we know, the RAF were the first to take a pop at them. We've been keeping a close eye on the sky since Putin started making sorties in our airspace. So any unidentified craft heading west from Russia goes straight to full-scale alert. We scrambled a squadron of typhoons out of Lossy Mouth and they encountered four fireballs north of Shetland. They couldn't establish radio contact and the radar showed the fireballs were decelerating, so the order was given to fire on them. What happened? The first one they hit just disintegrated. I've seen the footage. It just seemed to evaporate in the air. Same with the second and the third. And then your flyers got complacent? <sighs> what can I say? The squadron leader moved in close to the fourth one for a better oh, view God, and... Oh, God, this is not going to end well. One of the other pilots shot at the fireball and it behaved exactly like the others, except that what had apparently evaporated was solid enough to shred a typhoon. <laughs> shred it? <laughs> I, I don't know how else to describe it. It fragmented like it had been put into a blender. And you're telling us this why exactly? We know the Americans have had similar close encounters, though they haven't lost any planes as far as we know. We think the Russians have lost a couple of planes. The point is, 
Nobody is responsible for him. Nobody on earth has technology like this. And you're saying what? <laughs> what they've, they've come from outer space. <laughs> yes. But not the way you were meaning. The scientists are saying they're the remains of an asteroid that disintegrated close to Earth's atmosphere. They're quietly very excited about it. Very quiet. I haven't heard a thing about this. The government didn't want to frighten people. Say asteroid and people panic. They've seen the movies. But there's nothing to be worried about. And that's what we want you to get across to your audience. It's exciting, but it's not threatening. The trouble with Denzel's explanation was that the fireballs kept coming, and none of them ever seemed to hit the ground, only large bodies of water. So after months of unconvincing asteroid stories, Phil decided to try out her charms on Professor Alistair Becker, a scientist specialising in climate studies and oceanography, and known for being a bit of a maverick. Everybody says you're the man when it comes to the fireballs. Well, I'm one of them. The one they like to dismiss until I'm proved right. Well, it's good to know I'm not the only one who feels like that. My husband and I think the asteroid explanation <laughs> is full of holes. But now the fireballs seem finally to be petering out, I'm trying to put together the definitive program. Petering out? The numbers of sightings have been diminishing over the past month, and there's been nothing at all for three days, which hasn't happened since we saw the first ones in the Arctic five months ago. Indeed. Of course, the fact that none has been reported doesn't mean that none have occurred. No. It's not inconceivable that there may have been fireballs where there was nobody to witness them. I, I understand that, but if we could start with a working hypothesis that they've stopped, I'd really appreciate it if you could share what you know with us. Share rather implies a two-way thoroughfare. Do you, <laughs> in fact, have anything to share? Uh, I've um, <clears throat> put this map together of all the reports I could find that seemed credible. Um, where there are pics, you can uh, click on the thumbnails and, and bring them up like that one. Ah, yes, very clear. And uh, uh, this is a, a graph based on the dates of the sightings. Classic bell curve. Mm. I too have a map, but it looks remarkably similar to yours. Look, there are five very definite clusters of sightings. Southwest of Cuba, 600 miles south of the Cocos Islands, Heavy concentrations off the Philippines, Japan, and the Aleutians. Then there's a small group northeast of the Falklands. Have you, have you worked out what it is that connects these clusters? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> they're all over water. Not only water. If you overlay a bathymetric map... So it's, um, <laughs> bathymetric. A map that shows the ocean's depth. If you overlay that on the map of the sightings, you will see that the clusters huddle around the deepest parts of the ocean. Mostly around the 4,000 fathom mark, but as far as I can verify, nothing under 2,000 fathoms. That's... remarkable? Whatever it is, it's not accidental. Asteroids that disintegrate do not choose where they land. So are, are you saying the fireballs are intelligent? Intelligent or programmed, it's academic, really. So the question is, where did they come from? No, no, no. The question is predicated on the fact that somewhere in the order of 3,000 fireballs have gone down and nothing has come back up again, how on earth can they survive if they're at the bottom of the ocean where the pressure is an unimaginable 750 kilos per square centimetre? And what are they doing down there? Maybe they just disintegrated. Oh, let us hope so, my dear. Let us hope so.
when Phil caught up with me later in the BBC radio newsroom, I was gobsmacked by her revelations. He as good as said it. As good as isn't good enough. <laughs> Nobody with any credibility wants to put their head above the parapet and say the aliens have landed. But I could write a script that's quite speculative. It, it would be the last script the science department ever commissioned from us. What are you two cooking up? Nothing. <laughs> Good. That means you're free to follow something up. All that fireball stuff has given the two of you a bit of a reputation. I warned you. Strange phenomena. Oceans. We've just had a tip from some conference. A paper about unexplained discoloration in the ocean currents. Might be something, might be nothing. So you can get a piece out of it. But we don't know where... We'd be delighted, Bill. We caught up with Dr. Emma Chisholm, oceanographer, at a cafe near the university. I'm just delighted that the BBC is taking me seriously, because this is a very serious story. Can you give us the idiot's version, Emma? Most of our listeners have a <laughs> pretty limited scientific background. Well, actually, it's really straightforward. 71% of the planet's surface is covered by water. Our existence is governed by its behaviour, but 95% of it is unexplored. There's a lot we don't know about what's going on down there. But you think something is going on down there? Looks like it. There are certain ocean currents that behave in predictable ways. We know pretty much where they go and what they do. And in the last few weeks, something odd has been happening to them. What kind of odd? It started with the Kuroshio current on the west side of the North Pacific. It's the Japanese equivalent of the Gulf Stream. Then it was the East Kamchatka current. What started? A discoloration. And that's a big deal? Oh, yeah. Preliminary analysis indicates the presence of radiolarian ooze. This is the stuff from deep down in the ocean, like 3,000 fathoms down in the equatorial zone. It basically just sits there. It shouldn't be hundreds of miles north up near the surface. It just shouldn't be there. It's not necessarily a bad thing. There's lots of nutritious oozes down there, and stirring them up will provide food for plankton, which in turn means food for fish. So the price of fish should go down, which is cool, if you like fish, which I don't, as it happens. <laughs> but what about underwater volcanoes? Couldn't they be responsible? There's been no recorded seismic activity, plus that's not really the most significant area for that kind of feature. So what's going on? I have no idea. If it was happening near the surface, I'd say it was mining or drilling for oil or gas, but that's insane. You couldn't possibly use machinery at that depth. It's probably got something to do with climate change, but nobody's quite sure how. What about all those fireballs that fell into the deep parts of the ocean? What if they exploded down there? <laughs> do, you, do you have any idea how much explosive you'd need to provoke this kind of disturbance? <laughs> no. <laughs> do you? <laughs> well, a lot more than a few fireballs, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, but that's only part of what me and my team think is going on. I didn't even mention this in my paper because it's just possible we might be wrong and this is too scary to contemplate. Can you tell us? I probably shouldn't. Not all my team agree with me, but I think it should be out there. But you know what you're talking about. Right, because climate change is a reality, and we need to face up to it, not pretend it isn't happening. We do. You're so right. Yeah, well, the reason we're doing the sampling of the deep sea currents wasn't because of discoloration. That was a byproduct. What we're measuring is temperatures. And all the major currents are between half and three quarters of a degree colder than they should be. <laughs> I really thought she was going to drop a bombshell. <laughs> that big dramatic build-up for half a degree. And even she had to concede it could be within the limits of normal variation. Look away now, there's no, no story, story here. here. <laughs> Mind you, we might be able to spin a little item out of the discoloration. Seamen spot stains. <laughs> that, that is so not going to happen. Oh, please. <laughs> oh, it's a message from Denzel. <laughs> the MOD's going exploring. You want to get yourselves on board HMS Rutland? Trust me, you won't want to miss this.
so, three weeks later, we were among a handful of hacks on board a Royal Navy frigate heading out from Bermuda to a spot a hundred miles or so east of Cuba. The Navy weren't keen on our presence, but the government wanted to be seen to be at the forefront of research into what was going on down there. We were barely underway before Lieutenant Aziz set about briefing us. Oh, look, Mike. This is um, Professor Becker. Professor Becker, how, how lovely to see you. If you'd like to settle down, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm Lieutenant Aziz. So it's my job to brief you on what we'll be doing and what we expect from you. We're heading for a point where over 400 sightings of fireballs occurred over a period of weeks some months ago. The details of the sightings will be in your briefing packs. Once we get there, we'll be lowering a manned bathosphere into uh, the... So what, what exactly is a, is a bathosphere? It's an uh, updated version of a bit of kit that was invented in the 1930s. It's basically a metal sphere with windows to allow observation at depth. Attached by a source of umbilical cord to allow transmission of images. Our version can go much deeper than the original. Why not use a submarine like James Cameron did? Because the bathosphere gives us simultaneous images and commentary and two-way communication. So, like I said, we'll be lowering it to a depth of up to 3,000 fathoms. I'm told it can go deeper, but we're erring on the side of caution. You guys will be set up in a special viewing room where you can see and hear the live feeds and prepare your reports. I've been told we've only got limited access to communication systems. That's right. So how do we transmit our broadcasts and our copy back to base? Ultimately, this is a military operation, so it's subject to the usual requirements of security. Your organisations were made aware of this before we left. Obviously, we'll try to get your stories out there as soon as possible, but you may be subject to certain restraints. Censorship, you mean? Responsible restraints, sir. What are we expecting to see? We'd rather not speculate. <laughs> Which translates as your guess is as good as mine, Mrs. Watson. <laughs> is the official line still that these fireballs are debris from an asteroid? No comment. That's all I have for you now, but I will keep you informed. Oh, uh, Professor, we had no idea you were coming with us. This is all very exciting, isn't it? I hope not, Mrs. Watson. I do hope not. Are we all set? All in order below? Aye, aye, aye sir. sir. Underwater life does seem to exist in fairly well-defined strata. Fish, then plankton, which looks like static on a TV screen, then deeper and colder, not much of anything. Then the real depths, where the very strange-looking evolutionary oddities exist. I don't think we're going to see anything of note till we get down below two and a half thousand fathoms. These things were drawn to the deeps for a reason. You're still talking as if they're sentient. That's because it's still the only sensible theory. If you're right, maybe they're not drawn to the deep so much as drawn away from where people are. Now, that is an interesting idea. More life round here. Plenty of squid. All shapes and sizes. All bloody ugly, though. Talk about nature's careless moments. out there, right on the edge of the line. I don't think it's a giant squid, it's more like a whale. But not in this depth, surely. How deep are they, precisely? Uh, 2,800 fathoms and small change. And he's right, it's not a whale. A whale would have imploded under the pressure long before that depth. What the hell is it? It's veered off now, whatever it was. Oh, there's some luminous fish over there. Quite pretty. The whale thing's back again. It's right on the edge of the light. I don't think the cameras are picking it up. It's big, like a giant turtle. You've been reading too much Terry Pratchett. Up here we can only see a vague oval-shaped patch of light. Seems to be circling the bathosphere. Now it's rising up. Disappearing from sight. And off 
we go? There should be a window in the top of this thing. Maybe see the underside. What's happened? Mike? Something's gone wrong. We've lost the live feed. Wherever that bathosphere is now, it's not at the end of that cable, look. It's moving at that speed. Well, you think the cable's been severed? It's bitten through by some kind of sea monster. Possible. Apparently, you can change the laws of physics. A week later, we were still shaken, but Phil had managed to guilt Denzel into meeting us in a pub where nobody knew him. I shouldn't be here. If it hadn't been for your tip off, we wouldn't have been on that ship at all. As it is, we might as well not have been. We made a brilliant documentary, something that went beyond paying tribute to those poor dead sailors, and your lot have gone and slapped a D-notice on it. Phil, I shouldn't be talking to you about it at all. Those cables weren't sheared through. The end of the cables would have been frayed and torn, but they weren't. They were fused. The metal and plastic were melted like glass. Becker says it breaks all the laws of physics. If it's Becker you're relying on, you're a busted flush. All that mad talk of intelligent creatures from outer space. He could tell the MOD the sky was blue and we'd go outside to check. That cable came out of the ocean looking like it had just come out of a blast furnace. No asteroid debris did that. Look, I'm sorry. I heard your programme and you're right, Phil, it was brilliant. When can it go out, Denzel? You ask me, love? Probably never. I think in his line of business, Denzel would know never to say never. Only two days later, we were in the newsroom when he rang. So, what are you going to ban today? There's no need to be like that, Mike. Because today I am Mr. Nice Guy. I'm here to tell you your ban is lifted. You can run your broadcast whenever you like. What, as is? No cuts? No changes? We're not in the business of censorship, Mike. Just the public interest. Why the change of heart? A week ago we were toxic and now we're flavour of the month. What's going on, Denzel? Denzel's given us the go-ahead. I'm not surprised. Why? Refresh your news screen. Ah. Uh. Exactly. I love the internet. No more secrets anymore. Sources close to the Pentagon say an American naval unit conducting research into deep sea conditions east of the Philippines has reported the loss of a midget submarine with its crew of two submariners. That is one hell of a leak. I hear the sound of a witch hunt. Hey, you two, dust off that bloody documentary. We've got the green light. I'm putting it out this morning in the 11 o'clock slot. Everything went quiet after the Americans lost their sub. It was as if the ocean deeps didn't exist. Then an old friend from the US sent me a link to a darknet site promising some interesting footage. What are we watching? It's a live stream video from a US naval exercise. Huh. How unlike the Americans to share so openly. Oh, uh, <laughs> this isn't official, Professor. This is the kind of thing that gets you 30 years in an orange jumpsuit. Turn up the volume, Phil. We're on a supply ship a few hundred yards from the USS Pericles. They've lowered a robot into the sea. It's going down fast. We're past a thousand fathoms already. That's six thousand feet, which sounds like a long way down, but there's a lot further to go around here. Oh my god! Uh, scroll back, Mike. Look, that's just the same as what happened to our bathosphere. A flash, 
Then everything went blank. We've lost contact with the robot probe. I'm looking across to the Paraclete and... And... And I've never seen anything like it. It's like lightning running all over the ship. Blue sparks and jagged arcs jumping between different parts of the deck. She just blew up. The Pericles blew up. After the Pericles, everything went quiet. There was nothing for it but to go back to doing what we do best making slightly eccentric radio documentaries. We were both thrilled when Phyllis became pregnant. We spent the last three months of the pregnancy in the Scottish borders. My grandmother had left me her cottage on a hillside overlooking the River Tweed, and I passed my days renovating it while Phyllis slowly worked her way round after me with a paint roller. By the time Stephen was born, we'd transformed the place into the perfect family holiday home. But we weren't a perfect family for long. Stephen was just three weeks old when he contracted a respiratory infection. The antibiotics didn't work and he died before he was a month old. We were stunned. Grieving. Stumbling from one day to the next. One evening, back in London, I ran into Alistair Becker at a book launch. I think even he saw how miserable I was and dragged me off to the pub. I was sorry to hear about your trouble. Thanks. We decided to come back to London, throw ourselves into work. Not a bad plan. And how is Mrs Watson? She's back up in the borders for a few days, writing scripts. She says she can think more clearly up there. Do give her my best wishes. I will. So, any fresh news on the Pericles? We just kept hitting brick walls. The US Navy poured gallons of cold water over any suggestion that it wasn't a freak electrical storm. The videos disappeared from the dark net. The MOD. Hmm. Denzel won't take calls from either of us. He ignores our emails. Phil even went round to his flat, but the caretaker said he was abroad on a tour of duty. I hear the Russians and the Australians had the same sort of experience as the Pericles, but nothing's been said publicly. Nobody's very keen to go poking around on the seabed now. So what, everybody's just ignoring it? There's a working group at the Admiralty, but from what I can gather, they mostly sit around looking glum. There was one thing, though. Did you, did you see any of the coverage of the Safira Island? doesn't ring a bell, sorry. Tiny speck in the Atlantic near the equator. Nominally Brazilian, but it's a few hundred miles off the coast so nobody bothers with it much. Population of 127 people, 50 or so goats and around 500 sheep. Every six weeks or so, a supply ship rolls up to exchange the essentials of life for hairy sweaters and mutton. The crew usually stays overnight to partake of the islander's version of coconut rum. So the supply ship emails ahead as usual, anchors in the bay and sounds its siren, but... Instead of the islanders scurrying down to the quayside, there's not a soul in sight. This isn't going to end well, is it? The lads from the supply ship went ashore in their jolly boat and found the place deserted. They searched the village top to bottom and couldn't find a living soul. The only sign that there had ever been anyone there was a... was a dead baby in a crib in the back bedroom. They combed the rest of the island and soon realised almost all the animals were gone too. Not dead and... Rotting. Gone. Marie Celeste Island. But for me, the interesting thing is that the waters around Safira Island are almost 4,000 fathoms deep. 
Well, do you think we're talking creature from the Black Lagoon stuff here? <laughs> I wouldn't characterise it in those terms, but you know what I think. The unthinkable. Or at least the unsayable. Of course, I told Phil about Safira when she got back to London. She seized on it the way she seized on anything that kept her mind away from thoughts of Stephen. There's an interesting story here from Indonesia. Lenten Island is the last in the chain of an archipelago. A couple of uh, yachties put in to refuel and stock up on fresh water and found the main settlement deserted. They decided to fill up anyway, they didn't have much choice, and stay over. Next morning, a couple of kids appeared on the quayside. They were clearly terrified. They told a wild story about whales coming up from the sea and stinging everyone to death. <laughs> the yachties thought they were misunderstanding, but something had obviously happened, so they persuaded the kids to come on board and sailed off to the next inhabited island. Where they discovered the kids were telling the truth? But some sort of truth. They wouldn't shift from their story. They'd escaped because they were sleeping in a treehouse right on the edge of the village. They say the villagers shot at the whales, but the bullets just bounced off. So what's the official line? Well, it's on the record that the Australians have been trying to chase down a gang of people smugglers allegedly raising funds for terrorists in that neck of the woods. The Indonesians are accusing them of sending amphibious craft up the beach and terrorising the locals into fleeing. And the Australians vehemently deny it? In no uncertain terms. It's all got very prickly. Fascinating. But we have interviews to set up for our forensic <sighs> entomology documentary. Never mind weird whales. Focus on flesh-eating beetles. Coming up with interesting stories is our bread and butter, though. So the next time I was in the newsroom, I pitched it to Bill. Three similar reports in the last two weeks alone, that makes five, sailors arriving at remote islands to find the settlements empty of life, not just humans, dogs and cats and sheep and goats. No evidence of anything sinister, Mike. Deep grooves on the beach on the sort of scale that whales could make? Or boats dragged up above the high water mark. Well, what about the abandoned phone on that atoll east of Tokyo? What? 27 seconds of blurred footage that could have been anything? It was something. You're starting to sound like the Blair Witch Project. Something is happening out there, Bill. We should be covering it. More than that, we should be investigating it. And how do you propose to do that? There's thousands of little islands out there. So far, these incidents have happened off Brazil, Indonesia, Alaska, the Philippines and Japan. What are you going to do? Stick a pin in the map and sit in the sunshine till something happens? You could sit there until we all die. But, Bill, Alistair Becker says... If Becker had any proof for his mad ideas, he'd have produced it by now. More to the point, when's Phyllis going to finish editing your Bugs and Beetles programme? Not everyone was so sceptical about Alistair's ideas. And that's how Phil and I ended up on a small plane flying from Miami to Escondida, one of the less significant Cayman Islands. And the Gurgis Foundation just handed you a wad of cash? It can be very blunt on occasion, Mrs. Watson. I demonstrated to them the algorithm we developed to indicate where future incursions were likely to take place, and they saw the wisdom of attempting to conduct a scientific inquiry into whatever is happening to small, isolated island communities. Oh, well, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> they just handed you a wad of cash. Mm -hmm. Just be grateful I insisted you were part of the package. And we couldn't be happier, could we, Mike? So you reckon you know where to expect the next invasion? Incursion, not invasion. Invasion implies the intention to remain. Whatever these creatures are, they either can't or don't want to hang around. If they're used to the deeps, I suspect it's can't. Where, Professor? Escondida tops my shortlist. 
A small island with a single settlement that has, as far as we are concerned, the advantage of being a British possession, which means we have the tacit support of the government. And what are we going to do there? We wait, dear boy. We wait. we did. It wasn't exactly a hardship. The town nestled between twin mountains, naked peaks with a scarf of greenery about their shoulders. The sun shone, the locals were friendly, the fish were fresh and the rum delicious. The crescent-shaped beach was the perfect vantage point for looking out over the ocean. We waited for the whales and they went elsewhere. There you are. Here I mostly am, deepening my tan and thinking how lovely my beautiful wife is in her bikini. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm working my fingers to the bone, checking out what's happening in the world. You are a researcher. Producer. A producer, Thank after you. all. There's your job. <laughs> Ow. So, there was another one last night. Some tiny Pacific atoll a few hundred miles from Australia. That makes four since we set up camp here. And none within a thousand miles of us. Do you think Becker's got it wrong? I don't know. Did he show me his list? Two of the four attacks happened on islands on it. Number seven and number ten. So it's not just a high-class version of Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo. Oh, and by the way, there are two eyewitnesses for the latest one. Only two? These things don't mess around, do they? <laughs> well, you almost wouldn't want to be a survivor. Think how we are You're losing Stephen. <laughs> These two have lost everyone. Except each other. And we know what that means too. So, what did these eyewitnesses have to say? <laughs> Disappointingly little. Two young men who were up in a cave on the hillside above the village, looking for a bit of privacy supposedly to have a drink. They were alerted by screams coming from down below. They couldn't see much, but they said the two things in the village square were more like uh, tanks than whales. And they said they saw two big wobbly spheres <laughs> rolling towards the water. And they ran back inside the cave and stayed there till morning. And that's it. That's all. It was dark last night, remember, in your quarter moon. But there were the usual wide, semicircular grooves in the beach, two heading up, two heading back towards the water. And a couple of houses were virtually demolished. They um, you know, obstructed the route into the square. They looked like they were just <laughs> bulldozed out of the way. Other houses had broken windows and smashed doors. <laughs> no whale's going to do that. It is uncanny, the way that everybody disappears. It makes no sense. I'm almost beginning to hope they don't show up here. Don't worry, we'll be fine. <laughs> Becker's team have got all the lights and cameras rigged up. It won't be like those other places where they don't have so much as a street lamp. Mm. But we're here to watch and stay safe. We're here to tell the story, Phil. We're here to live to tell the tale. Mm. Oh, it's Emma. Hi, Emma. How are you doing? Good to hear from you. Hi, Phil. Listen, I hope you don't mind me getting in touch. No way. Oceans are our bread and butter these days. How can I help you? Well, 
You were the only one who took me seriously before when I was talking about discoloration in the ocean currents, so I thought you might be interested. Interested in what? The initial areas of discoloration have been gradually clearing. Oh, that, that's good, isn't it? Broadly speaking, yes, but the thing is, it's cropped up somewhere else, somewhere potentially much more worrying. Where? In the Caribbean and the Pacific, on either side of the Panama Isthmus. Well, why is that worrying? You know how I said if I was really reaching, I'd say it was down to mining? Mm. Well, we built the Panama Canal to provide a route between the Atlantic and the Pacific. If I lived at the bottom of the sea, I might think the same thing was quite useful. Even a Caribbean hotel room loses its charm after a while, and after three weeks we were getting tired of waiting for something that wasn't happening. Leave the moon and the stars alone and come to bed. You have no soul. It's nearly one o'clock. On Escondida, life laughs at clocksmiths. <laughs> so did you see what I did there? Because yeah. it's like, mm. If you can't beat them, join them. What is lovely, you're right. I'm always right. You know that. Oh my God, Mike, do you think this is it? Right, set up the solid state recorder. I've got the digital. I'm going to set up a separate digital source on the windowsill. Loads of Atmos. Harry! Harry, get the lights on. I think we've got some action going on. Wow, they're bright. It's like daylight. There's Becker's boys hustling across the square. Uh -huh. I'm going. What are you doing? I'm locking the door. I need to go down there with them. I need to see what's happening. That's why we're here. Everywhere else, the people who rushed to see what was happening disappeared. That's not going to happen to you, to it's, us. It's our job. Give me the key. It is our job, and this is where we'll do it from, because this is where we can see what's happening. The key fell. So you threw the key out the window? I did. So can we stop arguing and get on with our jobs? Press record. The exodus has stopped. A solid crowd jams the entrances to the narrow alleys that lead towards the sea. More people are still crowding into the square, but now there's no way out. Gunshots are coming from the harbour. And now people are trying to turn back into the square. Whatever's going on at the harbour, people have stopped running towards it and started running away from it. It's a scene of utter chaos. The priest... Right, the priest. Well, the priest has come out of the church. He's spreading his arms in a blessing, and a couple of dozen people have thrown themselves at his feet. It, it sounds as if someone was dragging a metal sledge over the cobblestones up the alleys from the harbour. And now the sounds of demolition fill the night. People have fallen silent, gripped by terror. Now, a, a curve of dull grey metal is pushing its way into the square, carrying away the corner of a house as it comes. Nothing so much as scratches it. Not bricks, not beams, not glass. It grinds on remorselessly, carrying all before it. It's about the size of a double-decker bus. If you can imagine a double-decker bus, the shape of a rugby ball. I've never seen anything like it. A half a dozen men have appeared with rifles and they are shooting at it, but their bullets don't leave a mark. They just 
bounce off as if made of rubber. Oh, and now there's a second one emerging from the alley on the other side of the square. And now they've paused. Still brooding presences. There's nothing random about this. Look. The first one's bulging. God, that's a scene. What could that be? Now the top of the first tank is starting to bulge. A uh, quivering white dome is forming, growing bigger by the second. Well, now the other tank is doing the same thing. The dome's growing, it's changing shape. It's as if the tank is blowing a giant bubble. It's spherical now, attached by a single strand. It's like a balloon on a string, getting bigger all the time. It must be almost two meters across now. And it's shuddering as if it had been punched. I've never seen anything like this. And now it's completely separated from the tank. It's uh, rising up into the air a meter, two meters, three meters. Dear God! Uh, the balloon split open. Hundreds of long, fleshy white petals flying out in all directions. Get away from the window! Why, are you okay? What the hell was that? As we huddle in our hotel room, uh, some of the strange white petals come flying in through the window. As soon as they hit the floor or the bed, they start to contract and make for the exit. Ah! It's on my arm, Mike! Ah! Ah! It's on my arm! Oh, pull it off! It's, it's, it's stuck to my fingers! Help me, Mike! What do you mean? What do you mean? Come on to the window! I can't! Help me! Help me! I've got you! I've got you! I've got you. I can't stop you! I can't stop you! No! Crock and Wakes by John Wyndham, adapted for radio by Val McDermott. Phyllis was played by Tamsin Gregg, Mike by Paul Higgins, Professor Becker by Richard Harrington, and Dr Chisholm by Sally Carmen. The Today host was Gareth Cassidy, and Lieutenant Aziz, Abdullah Afsal. The music was composed by Alan E. Williams, conducted by Clark Rundell, and performed by the BBC Philharmonic Orchestra. It was directed by Justine Potter, and was a savvy production for the BBC. How is she? She's sleeping now. There was some morphine in the pilot's first aid kit. That thing ripped the skin off her arms and her finger. I thought we'd never get it to stop bleeding. She's going to be in agony. If you hadn't grabbed her... No, I know, Alistair, believe me, I know. As it was, it nearly had the pair of us out the window. If I hadn't got my legs around that bed, if the bed hadn't been screwed to the wall, it doesn't bear thinking about We'll fly her out at first light. Thank you. I'd thought I was going to lose my wife that night. In a few short minutes, our romantic Caribbean hotel room had turned into a scene from hell. But I was determined to bear witness to what she'd gone through. 
her and all the people who had met such a horrific end on Escondida. So while Phil slept her drugged sleep, I made what I still think is one of my best programmes. Only nobody got to hear it. And there are certain things no reputable broadcaster will transmit. Things likely to cause panic and riots in the streets, for example. Outside in the square it was pandemonium as people tried to escape. The sticky tentacles dragged people back by whatever they'd gripped onto. Grown adults hauled across the square by an arm or a leg or, worst of all, a teenage boy with one of the tongues stuck to his face. Those horrifying, fleshy, adhesive petals mashed people together, cramming them into obscene balls of humanity, arms and legs flailing out of them. And then they rolled back down the street towards the sea, avoiding obstacles as they went. And still more balloons kept growing and swelling and splitting, and those terrible, terrible tentacles kept flying through the air, breaking windows, smashing doors, finding victims, until finally the tanks ground their way back to the ocean. Escondida is a ghost town this morning. Almost the entire population was carried off last night. From what we can tell, there are fewer than 30 survivors. One of our party, camera technician Carla Thompson, is among the missing. We just put it out there on the web and tell the powers that be that someone leaked it. Yeah, we'll get fired. Yeah, so we'll go freelance, live off the land, whatever. Now, we'll open with a montage of the attack on Escondida. We've got plenty to work with there. And then you can interview the professor here. What I have to say will be primarily speculative. But it's always such good speculation, professor. Excuse me. Yes, Johnny. I'm at the hospital in Miami with the Watsons. What? What? Where? You can get us there. Yes, half an hour. There's been another attack off Bermuda, but this time the locals blew them up. Blew them up? Johnny's getting a plane ready. I told him we'll be there in about... In half an hour. Mike, pack up the gear. We've got work to do. Okay, rolling, Mike. I'm on the beach on Condor Quay, a tiny spur of land about 60 miles east of Bermuda. Tonight, history was made here when the 47 inhabitants took on a trio of marauding sea tanks and won. Here on Condor Quay, the only significant industry is the quarrying and polishing of a vein of coralline limestone that's particularly rich in fossils. And that means the islanders were uniquely placed to take on the invaders. Jonah Campbell is the head quarryman here. Jonah. Can you tell me what happened earlier tonight? It was an ordinary evening. People were sitting out in front of their houses like they usually do, talking and having a drink together. Then all of a sudden these big metal tanks come grinding up the beach, heading straight for us. Had you already heard about the sea tanks? Sure, we have satellite TV here, we have internet. We've been talking earlier about what happened on Escondida. Had you made any preparations for an attack? Oh yeah. We used little dynamite charges to break up seams in the quarry, so I brought half a dozen home with me, just in case. So, when you saw the tanks? Me and a couple of the boys, we ran down to meet them. We rolled a couple of charges under each of them, and we ran like the Lugaru was after us. Uh, what happened when the charges blew? Man, it was like they just disintegrated. Hundreds of shards of this pale metal came floating down like feathers. And this horrible, stinky goo showered the whole damn village. 
We had to come up the beach here half a mile because nobody can stand to be around this smell without gagging and retching. God alone knows how we're going to get rid of that. Jonah is not exaggerating, but I did get close enough to pick up a fragment of the dull grey metal that makes up the outer skin of the sea tanks, and it's incredibly light. If you ever set fire to slender strips of magnesium in chemistry class, it's that kind of feathery weightlessness. Brilliant. Uh, we'll cut there. Thanks, Jonah. You were really great. You're welcome. We just want to tell people how to beat these monsters. You guys did an amazing job. Okay, Alistair, you're up. <coughs> With me here on Condor Key is the distinguished scientist, Professor Alistair Becker. What do you think we're seeing here? In the first place, we have facts. On Escondida, what we saw was not unlike a distant relative of a sea anemone. That ability to detect a living organism and latch onto it. But where a sea anemone's tentacles are attached to the mouth and digestive system of the creature, these tentacles are free-standing, or rather, free-searching. Furthermore, they can detect their victims even through clothing and walls, but there is something even more troubling about what we saw in Escondida. What's that, Professor? Towards the end of the attack, the tentacles switched their attention from the animate to the inanimate. They began to rip down the lighting and cameras we'd rigged up as if they preferred the dark, almost as if they wanted there to be no record of their activities. Surely that's a bit fanciful, Professor. Sea monsters who can figure out how to turn off the lights. Well, that would indeed be fanciful if they were simply sea monsters. But if they were machines being controlled remotely by creatures in the deeps, rather than being fanciful, it becomes the only reasonable hypothesis. But we've seen no sign of machinery, just this stinking green slime. Clearly, given the area the slime has covered, it was held under immense pressure. A level of pressure we humans can barely comprehend, never mind recreate, inside a skin of metal mere millimetres thick. We think of machinery as being metal or plastic parts moving in such a way to achieve a particular end. These days, we also think of digital platforms underpinned by silicon chips, inorganic materials, in other words. But imagine if we could work with organic living materials to make machines. After all, as Leibniz suggested, humans are simply organic machines. I believe the creatures at the bottom of the sea are capable of designing living machines they can manipulate via remote control. That's a big leap. It's the only one that makes sense of the data we have. You genuinely believe there are creatures from outer space in the deep oceans who are mounting attacks on us? I would be delighted if you could come up with an alternative that covers all the data. I suppose for a moment you're right. What do you suggest we do about it? At the micro level? I suggest we arm every coastal settlement near the deeps with grenades and mortars. At the macro level, I think we can only hope that their plans for the planet do not include our extinction. I'm... I'm, I'm cutting there, sorry. <laughs> Professor, what are you trying to do? You're going to make the credulous half of the audience hysterical and the sensible half completely incredulous. Are you suggesting I lie to your listeners? <laughs> there have been lords of the earth before us. Some of them in a stronger position. There was a wide variety of dinosaur species which should have given some a chance of survival. All the human eggs, on the other hand, are pretty much in one basket. We slipped a copy to a geeky pile of fellows who arranged the leak. Within 24 hours, Denzel had come out of hiding. 
And I'm telling you, it was totally irresponsible to put that out. We didn't. It was leaked. Someone obviously thought people deserved the truth, and Becker's argument is very persuasive, Denzel. Not to mention it makes great radio. All of that may be true, but what's the point in panicking people? Because sometimes panic is the only way to light a fire under our great leaders. Which would be all good and well if there was anything the politicians could actually do. Becker did have a suggestion. Do you seriously imagine that any government is going to arm its citizens with grenades and dynamite? Get real, Mike. If they don't, people will take matters into their own hands, and that, Denzel, will be a hell of a lot worse. It doesn't have to be armed vigilantes. Why do you men always leap to the worst-case scenario? Why can't they just station half a dozen soldiers every few miles along the coast? (laughs) They're trained for that sort of thing, after all. But... 31,000 kilometres of UK coastline. (laughs) So... Five troops every five clicks means 31,000 troops. That's one-fifth of the total strength of the army. And that's not allowing for more than one shift a day. Never mind leave or rest days. We'd have to recall every unit serving overseas, including the ones working on aid projects. Oh, it's just not practical, Phil. Then I guess we're back to the vigilante scenario. separate incidents in Vanuatu last night. Over 200 Frankish dead. marinos atacaron una aldea continental aquí en Suriname. El elemento sorpresa significaba más de 500 personas. Utført et koordinert angrep på Svalbard like før midnatt. Men lokalbefolkningen var godt forberedt og reddet utallige liv ved å angripe stridsvognene med gruveeksplosiver. Men de eksploderende tankene with recorded attacks now numbering the hundreds and seemingly growing bolder, increasingly people are taking the law into their own hands. Last night alone. I know you hate my graphs. Because we make radio programs. But... Wait, no, you have to admit, sometimes they are worth a thousand words. Look at this, Mike. What's a bell curve? And they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Can you guess what it represents? Our income? <laughs> Hardly. Not now we're the Xenobath experts. The what? I had an email from the professor this morning. That's what he's calling them now. From the Greek, Xeno, meaning foreigner, bath, meaning... Deep. Yes, I get it. Uh, yes, We have done well out of other people's misery, apart from your skin grafts, obviously. So what's your bell curve? Sea tank incursions. Since we started seriously blowing them up in large numbers, they've gradually stopped coming ashore. Well, that's a good thing. I'm not so sure. Why not? Well, (laughs) apart from the huge increase in illicitly held explosives all over the world, I don't think they're going to give up that easily. We can't both inherit the earth. As usual, when she was having a bit of a wobble, Phil took herself off to her cottage in the borders. I didn't mind being left behind. Not really. Not if it helped her keep it together. Hi, Emma. Wow. This is amazing. (sighs) What a fabulous view you've got. Mm -hmm. Is that the River Tweed down there? It is. Sorry, I I lost track of the time. I meant to have the kettle on. No worries. Are you bricklaying? Yes. Winston Churchill did it to relieve stress. And does it? I'm not sure I'm quite at that level yet. Uh, So what are you building? Uh, It's it's, uh, kind of an arbour, a um, sheltered place to sit and contemplate, or read, or just get drunk on a summer evening. Sounds good to me. Yeah, except it's too cold to sit outside even though it's June. Come on in. (laughs) (laughs) She's right, you know. We can't both inherit the earth. I don't see why not. They obviously can't live on the surface and we can't live in the deeps. What? You think a sort of planetary apartheid would work? 
Well, they've backed down over the sea tank attacks. You think so? Before we got better at blowing them up, they were travelling a long way from the deeps. Santander on the Bay of Biscay, Galway Bay, Chennai on the Bay of Bengal. They're encroaching on our territory. Well, maybe they're just trying to scare us into leaving them alone. Which would be a very serious error in my estimation. Here's to research. Cheers. Thanks, and mm. thanks for inviting me to stay. Mm. When I saw you were giving a seminar in Edinburgh, it seemed like a good opportunity to catch up. Well, you were the only person outside my research group who took me seriously last year. I'm sick and tired of being told our analysis is wrong, or it's just a blip, or the Argo Array is really only at beta stage. So what, um, what's the... Argo Array? Uh, um, it's um, a global array of free drifting profiling floats. There are about 4,000 of them, and there's more coming on stream every year. They analyze the temperature and the salinity of the upper 2,000 meters of the ocean. It's one of the main data sources we use. And uh, what's it telling us? Over the last two months, there's been a shocking and inexplicable acceleration in the rate at which the polar ice is melting. If it goes on like this, all the Arctic and Antarctic ice will be gone by next spring. Well, that can't be right. <laughs> Believe me, it's right. We've modelled the numbers everywhere we can think of. So what does that mean in, in, in practical terms? It's hard to know where to start. Nobody knows exactly how much ice there is under the surface, but the general view is that if it all melted, the sea level would rise by somewhere around 70 metres. 70 metres? Like, what, more than 200 feet? Yeah. But we're, we're only 305 feet above sea level here. Better buy a boat, then. Look, we modelled these maps to give an idea of what would happen. In the UK alone, we lose almost all of eastern England as far across as the Pennines. The southeast is history. Somerset's gone, along with most of coastal Wales and Lancashire. Birmingham's the only big conurbation left. Apart from a stub of Edinburgh, all of Scotland's significant population centres are drowned. Oh my God, that, that's, that's catastrophic. Denmark, gone, Bangladesh, submerged. Both seaboards of North America, a memory. 90% of the world's population would be affected. A refugee crisis that makes Syria look insignificant. There'll be revolutions, civil wars, nation-states will collapse. The geopolitics is the least of it. What we'd lose most of is the fertile land. And where we could still grow food, crops would fail because of disease and drought. The ones who don't drown will mostly starve. And uh, this, this is actually happening? It looks like it. <laughs> all the global warming predictors are running on fast forward. But w w with all that ice melting, won't it get colder? It, it's complicated. Polar glaciers are very white and reflect most of the sun's rays back into space, but once the ice melts, the terrain absorbs the sun's rays, so you get warming at the poles, which affects the major ocean currents that control the Earth's temperature patterns. Bigger oceans will transfer that heat around the globe faster, but in the process, we'll lose the Gulf Stream, which means here in the UK, we'll get colder. How much colder? Like Newfoundland? Somewhere between 6 and 10 degrees, it's, it's hard to be sure. But that's survivable, right? It depends. I've not even started on the volcanoes and the fault lines and the nuclear power stations built along the coasts. Concentrate on the role of women in the 1916 Easter Rising, Mike. It feels like fiddling while Rome sinks beneath the waves. Emma's team might be wrong, you know. Remember all those years we thought spinach was incredibly rich in iron because one scientist misplaced a decimal point? I keep dreaming about 
Whole coastlines shearing off and falling into the waves. That and volcanoes erupting where they were supposed to be extinct. Edinburgh Castle disappearing in a sea of lava. That's it. No more cheese after dinner. <laughs> don't, don't pretend you're not scared. <sighs> Professor Becker with a lovely surprise. Are you not following the news? No, we're writing this morning. Why? What's happening? Are the, are the sea tanks back? Just take a look at the news and get yourselves round here. What's Alison want? Oh, no. And no survivors. Whatever sunk the Yatsushiro happened so fast, the crew didn't have time to send a distress message. And because this is one of the deepest areas of the Pacific, salvage experts are already holding out little hope of recovering evidence from the site of the disaster. Over 2,600 passengers and crew one of the deepest areas of the Pacific. 2,600... Oh, Mike. It's just one ship. We can't spin a whole narrative from one ship. According to satellite imagery, the Yatsushira was making headway on its planned course. And three minutes later, there was nothing there. This was a modern ship less than five years old. Fitted with all the latest electronics and it vanished with nothing to show except the deck furniture that wasn't lashed down. Can you imagine what it must have been like for those poor people? Asleep in their berths and then suddenly... <laughs> in water pouring in and... <laughs> I can't bear to think about it. It's hard to resist the notion that this is the next phase. They want this planet to themselves. <laughs> Mid-Atlantic. The Queen Anne was the fastest liner of modern times, but she sank in less than a minute. Ceci est le troisième navire porte-conteneur à disparaître dans l'océan austral ce mois. Président Hollande a dit que... Iolande off the Philippines ended in disaster around 3 a.m. when the destroyer disappeared from radar screens, bringing the total of these inexplicable shipping losses to 47 so far. The Prime Minister is flying to an emergency summit in Washington. At least this is one summit where they don't have to worry about enemy spies. Sailing ships. We need to try sailing ships. I was speaking to the harbour master down in Plymouth earlier. Apparently they're completely jammed up. It's like a long stay airport car park for ships. And it's the same everywhere. It's hardly surprising. I mean, would you put to sea just now? Denzel, wasn't expecting you. I got a bit of news. I felt... Denzel? Got a little scoop for you guys. It'll be announced formally tomorrow, but I thought you deserved a heads up for old time's sake. You sound disgustingly cheerful. That's probably because I feel disgustingly cheerful. We found the solution to the shipping problem. <laughs> the shipping problem is... <laughs> <laughs> Is that what your people are calling it, Denzel? Thousands of people have died. It's not a problem. It's a disaster. Not anymore, it's not. So what's this solution? Fly everywhere? Well, luckily our geeks are not as defeatist as you, Michael. We figured out what those bastards in the deeps were doing. They have some sort of device that basically slices the bottom off a ship. How is that even possible? We don't really know, but some genius suggested trying sailing ships. And amazingly, they weren't attacked. So the boffins decided it was the vibrations of the engines that was triggering off the keel slicers. Keel slicers. <laughs> I almost like that, Denzel. In any other situation, I really would like it. Thank you, Phil. So they put their thinking caps on and came up with a device they're calling a dolphin. Don't ask me how it works, but basically the dolphin travels ahead of the vessel, and when anything approaches from below, it homes in on it and blows it sky high. And this actually works. Like a charm. And we can do a piece on it, ahead of the official release. Be my guest. Denzel, does your generosity have anything to do with a conversation I had a couple of days ago with one of your colleagues at the Ministry of Defence? I have no idea what you're talking about, Mike. What? 
Nobody told you about the missing American nuclear warhead? Truly, I really don't know what you're talking about. We have it from a reliable source that the US Navy dropped two nuclear bombs in the Arctic. The first one went off, huge plume of water and steam, a lot of dead marine life, but the second one disappeared without trace. So either the Americans dropped a faulty bomb... Which is frankly hard to believe. ...or the Xenobaths have got one. And you're desperately trying to make that story go away by handing us... A box of chocolates. <laughs> I think you've been listening to the wrong people. Then how do you explain the increased levels of radioactivity in the sea of Greenland? That'll be the Russians with an unauthorized nuclear test. You know what Putin's like. Do you really think we are that naive, Denzel? What I think, Mike, is that you and Phil would much rather report a real story based on fact than reckless rumor and silly speculation. <laughs> The dolphins really did work for about six weeks and then they stopped working and ships started sinking again. This time they shook themselves to pieces in a matter of minutes. Sometimes the people on board made it to the lifeboats, mostly they drowned. And that was the end of human beings' mastery of the seas. But within a matter of months, we had far more pressing things to worry about. You join us live here on the 69th floor of the Shard, Europe's tallest building, only a few hundred yards from the River Thames. This is the first spring tide since sea levels began to rise alarmingly quickly with the melting of the polar ice caps. And tonight, there are fears that for the first time since its construction, the Thames barrier may be defeated in its battle to hold back the rising tide. For weeks now, workers have been sandbagging the banks in a bid to ensure that even if the barrier fails, London will be saved. With me here tonight is Humza Sharif, one of the London Mayor's deputies. Good evening, Mike. Mr Sharif, can you give us a sense of what's at stake here? Let me emphasise, first of all, that we are confident in the precautions we have taken to protect London and its citizens. According to the Environment Agency, among the landmarks at risk are the Houses of Parliament, Whitehall, City Hall, Canary Wharf, Westminster Abbey, the Tower of London, Kew Gardens, the O2 Arena... That's a worst-case scenario, and it's irresponsible for you to frighten your listeners this way. These are estimates from an official government agency, Mr Sharif. 51 railway stations, 35 underground stations, 8 power stations, more than 1,000 electricity substations, 400 schools, 16 hospitals and over half a million homes, all at risk. We can see from here that the defences remain in place. The water is lapping at the sandbags, but it hasn't broken through. So I'm, I'm sorry to, uh, to interrupt you, Mr Sharif, but we, we are just getting reports that the water is starting to break through further upstream. Over now to our colleagues on Vauxhall Bridge. Yes, Phil, three separate streams of water are pouring into the street south of the river. The water is rushing past the MI5 building. It's already knee-deep, and people are struggling to get to safety. I, I can hear sirens, but there's no help here yet. The 
Environment Agency says the East Coast it's could see the most significant flooding in and very years. high river flows, both in Lancashire Buses and Yorkshire. By the sea. We've been this is Devon. With a Huge tides whip homes over and over a thousand miles of coastline. The area most at risk is the northeast coast, Northumberland through to Lincolnshire. It seems and the severe weather that's affected parts of Britain for days is not going away any time soon. Phil, you in London? Yes, uh, we've been in the shard all night. How's it looking this morning? Uh, it, yeah, it's still bad around Vauxhall. The water's receded, but a lot of homes are wrecked. And um, Eel Pie Island was apparently swamped. I hear things were a lot worse further north. Yeah, East Anglia took a hell of a hit, and uh, a couple of villages in Northumberland basically fell into the sea. <laughs> You should start making your own preparations. It's only going to get worse. Next spring tide, it'll be higher. They can't keep playing King Canute with the sandbags. London's going under its history. What I'm more worried about is the effect of all this extra water on the ocean basins. Why? Uh, what will that do? All of this extra weight of water from the melting ice caps, it's going to make the bottom of the ocean basin sink. Think of it uh, like a, a big puddle. As it gets deeper, it pulls in more from the edges. Coastal areas are going to fall into the sea, especially where there are existing fault lines like in California. And then the water gets access to areas of dormant volcanic activity. It penetrates the magma cap that's keeping those volcanoes quiet, and boom, you've suddenly got hundreds of them spewing out ash clouds. So, as well as no shipping, we'd have no flying? That's the least of our worries. There'll be no sunshine either. The temperature will plummet, crops will fail. All those refugees pouring inland from the subcontinent and the Pacific Rim are going to start fighting each other for food and shelter. <sighs> Christ, Emma, <laughs> you make it sound like the end of days. For most people it will be, Phil. Did you get that boat like I told you to? Mike thinks I'm overreacting, but <sighs> yes. A 26-foot sailboat currently under a tarpaulin on a trailer in Muzzle Hill. I hope it's packed to the gunnels with tins and packets of dried food. I hear you. Look, I need to go. We're packing up today. We're moving our lab from Oxford to Buxton in Derbyshire. It's more than 300 metres above sea level. Good luck with that. Uh, stay in touch. I'll do my best. Oh, and Phil, mm. make sure you have a shortwave radio on board. When we lose global comms, shortwave will still work. <sighs> Lord... I've just been speaking to Tim Bowler. Is he the one from the Cabinet Office? Looks like he escaped from a boxing gym. That's the one. They're moving Parliament to Birmingham. You're kidding? There's chaos all over the world, Phil. It's dog-eat-dog dog in Russia. Millions of people are dying in Asia. There's civil war in most of South America. At least our lot are trying to keep civil society functioning here. And Birmingham is going to be the last city standing? Exactly. Emma's team are uh, moving to Buxton. I can't say I blame them. Look, I know we talked about decamping to Scotland at some point. Do you think this is that point? Why are you asking that now? After I've spoken to Tim, I talked to Bill, and he admitted the BBC are making plans to evacuate too. There's a place for us with them if we want it. Or we could hang on here and be their eyes and ears in what's left of London. Are they going to Birmingham too? It's not been decided yet, but probably if that's where the politicians are going. I uh, think things could get very messy very quickly up there. I, I'd rather stay here for now. And when it all gets too grim, we can sail off to Scotland. Batten down the hatches there. You sure? They might get a bit lonely around here. <laughs> we don't really do lonely, Mike. We've always been more than enough for each other. And once we lose the internet and the TV, we'll have a lot more time for Scrabble. A giant inland sea that's been hollowed out at the centre of the continent, with the Murray River and Cooper's Creek flooding the desert plain. Reports suggest that Mexico has fallen into the sea. The longest lasting earthquake I've ever experienced. A furious wave comes roaring at 500 miles an hour, swallowing everything in its... 
Vamos a ampliar la zona de evacuación de 10 kilómetros a 20 kilómetros. There'd been no sign that the volcano was about to erupt. Just how fast the world's ice sheets Satellite are melting. Thousands of homeless, desperate. That we are living climate change in real time. Someone to blame. Melting ice and rising seas at record levels. Loss of undersea cable. The death toll is feared to be near a thousand, with hundreds still missing. Towns just wiped off the map by waves that moved as fast as a jet plane across the Pacific. Confirmed today that the internet is irrefutable. Russia, Japan, the Philippines, Indonesia, Guam, and the U.S. state of Hawaii as well. So now this is evolving to an international event. Dramatic footage there. Homes and buildings have literally just been washed away. Nation will no longer speak unto nation. The BBC left as an inflatable boat. And sometimes we had company aboard. So strange, trying to navigate one's way through waterways that used to be streets. <laughs> so many of the familiar landmarks submerge. Thank you for bringing me out with you. I thought you'd be interested. We mostly just do colour pieces these days. For the first few weeks, there was a lot going on with people trying to adjust to what was happening. There was a lot of street fighting in the higher parts of the city: Hampstead, Muswell Hill, Blackheath. People trying to stake out territory. Then they realised there was no point. Mostly, they were terrified of having to live without power, without sanitation, without shops. So, everybody who could get out left. And the rest? We get along, warily, and nobody trusts anybody else. When the food stocks start to run out, it's going to be a different story. But the idea is that we'll be gone before that becomes an issue. Scotland. There's quite a lot of it left. And uh, Mike speaks the language, so. But you still haven't told us why you've come back to London, Alistair. I can't work up there in Birmingham. There's no space to think. We're all living on top of each other, and no group of people bickers better than scientists. <laughs> Not to mention that conditions are grim. The food rations get less with every passing week, and if it wasn't for the army, we'd be overrun by vigilante mobs trying to steal our stores. Well, I had no idea it was that bad. <laughs> Your BBC colleagues are constrained in their reporting. It's been made clear that anyone who doesn't broadcast the party line will be thrown out to fend for themselves. Lord Reith must be spinning in his grave. I feel sure there must be a way to defeat these bloody creatures, but if we're going to find it, concentration is absolutely essential. So I hitched the lift with one of those MOD choppers, and <laughs> here I am. Where are you actually living? On Haverstock Hill. It used to be a hotel. The army took it over when the flooding started. I have no idea what they use it for. And the place is half empty, but well protected against marauders. I have two colleagues with me, so we can work both together and individually. You can't make the water go away, Alistair. No. Perhaps we can make the xenobaths go away. Who is it? Never mind that, just open the bloody door. Or we'll break it down! <sighs> Put the chain on, Mike. Well, that'll never stop them. No, but this might. Bloody hell, Phil, where did you get a shotgun? Just put the chain on. Get a move on, we haven't got all day. <sighs> I'm not afraid to use this, boys. Feel free to call my bluff. Shit! You said she'd be a pushover! You never cease to amaze me. Where did you get that? Remember that programme we made when the Craze film came out? When all this started, I thought it might be handy to have a weapon, so I called up, oh, that, you know, that lovely boy, Reggie and Ronnie's second cousin or whatever. <laughs> he sorted me out. Dear God. I think it's time we set sail, Mike. We can do a little package about our doorstep encounter, then we're out of here. What are we going to tell them in Birmingham? Nothing. We just go off the air. It's a long way to sail. We've got no choice, Mike. I sailed all my teens. It's not something you forget. 
I knew there was a good reason for taking up with someone so middle class. <laughs> Shotguns and sailing. <laughs> we never had any of that where I grew up. Oh. are all secure. Thanks. Oh, I've forgotten how much colder it is on the water. It's colder everywhere these days. It doesn't seem fair. Africa baking and we're freezing. We're here at six o'clock. Let's see if we can pick up anything on the radio. No longer in charge. Just 1,300 hours today, the British Army has taken control. Charles III has abdicated in favour of Flight Lieutenant William Windsor. Inability of government to maintain order. Long live King William. Sounds like we made the right decision. <laughs> it's all gone, isn't it? <laughs> everything we live by, it's gone. No, it's, no, no, not everything, Phil. We've still got each other. may have been the longest eight days of my life and thank God you filled the boat with provisions since somebody has ransacked this place. There's not so much as a tea bag left in the cupboards. There's always the arbor. The arbor? Come see my arbor. Oh, don't be mad, it's freezing. What? <laughs> so where did the steps come from? Follow me. Come down. In the name of the wee mud. Did you really think I'd waste my time on something as silly as an arbor? I got a digger crew from Carlisle to make a great big hole, put a pool liner in it, then I filled it with tins and dried food and whiskey and bricked over it. <laughs> There's enough down here to feed us for years if we're careful. I married a genius. It's true. You did. <laughs> it's been two years since we arrived at our cottage to find the expanded river tweed lapping at the bottom of the garden terraces and I've decided it's time to edit my audio diaries into a series of programmes I might as well use the old skills before I lose them we didn't think we were going to make it through the first winter as Emma had predicted black clouds of volcanic dust cut out most of the sunlight for weeks at a time I began to wonder why we'd installed all those solar panels Phyllis had insisted on. We huddled round the fire, wearing layers of clothes and wrapped in blankets, living on soup. I honestly wondered sometimes whether there was any point in going on. But about nine months ago, the sky slowly started to clear. And today, in the garden, I saw the first signs of vegetables pushing through the soil. I cried, I'm not ashamed to admit it. It's pretty safe round here. Now the weather's not so hellish, we've begun to form a community of sorts. There have been a couple of abortive raids by outsiders, but Phil fired a shot over their heads and they took off. We've heard nothing from Birmingham for a while now. The last news we had was that the army had fortified the city centre and outside their ring of steel, things were pretty lawless. Ours is a harsh life. But at least it is a life. And it looks as if there might be another one joining us in a few months. And of course, every day, I check whether there's anything on the radio. Oh, 
I love the triumph of hope over experience that is you with the clockwork radio. It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. <laughs> this is the Scottish Broadcasting Commission. And now, a message from the First Minister. We are proud today that we have restored radio broadcasting throughout Scotland. Standing here on the Castle Esplanade, I want to say that your government has not lost sight of the need to fight back against those who would destroy us. You don't often see helicopters these days. Shh, 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 Albo. Shh, 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 shh. It's not going to hurt you. It's military. Oh, poor Riso. She's not used to engine noise. That is Scottish government livery. <gasps> Slang. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's absolutely lovely. I haven't had whiskey like that for three years or more. Oh, it's worth being tossed around the sky in a tin box for a dram like that. And to meet your splendid little daughter. Mm -hmm. That was quite an entrance, Professor. <laughs> it's efficient. And there are damn few things left you can say that about. So why are you here? I believe our work has finally paid off. You've come up with a defence against the Xenobaths? Better than that, Mrs. Watson. We've developed a weapon against them. It's early days, but I think it might be possible to see them off. That sounds too good to be true. I can't say too much about it, but it's a sort of ultrasound bomb. It vibrates on a sympathetic frequency that causes them to disintegrate, we think. We've tested it half a dozen times. Within minutes, the surface of the sea started bubbling and great gouts of foul-smelling gel burst into the air. Remember Condor Key? It was like a very intense version of that smell. <laughs> Hideous. And you truly think we can kill them off? I do. It won't restore the planet overnight, but at least we'll have a fighting chance. You still haven't explained why you're here. We're starting again, Mike. And we need someone to keep the record. I told the Scottish government, which is all we have left by the way of government in these islands, that you two are the only ones I trust. What do you say? There's more than one kind of adventure, Professor. Yours is the big screen, technicolor kind, but I want the other kind, uh, the kind that's about rebuilding the world they've left us with. And there's no point in one without the other. Yes, I see. And you, Mike? Is that what you think, too? I can't tempt you back into the harness. We'll watch you from a distance, Professor. And maybe we'll tell the story so far so people will know what happened to our world before it became their world.
The Kraken Wakes by John Wyndham was adapted by Val McDermott. Mike Watson was played by Paul Higgins. Phyllis Watson was played by Tamsin Gregg. Professor Becker and Denzel Davis were played by Richard Harrington. Dr. Emma Chisholm and the reporter were played by Sally Carmen. Jonah, Submariner and other parts were played by Gareth Cassidy. And Humza was played by Abdullah Afzal. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon was played by Nicola Sturgeon. The Kraken Wakes was directed and produced by Justine Potter. It was performed as live in front of a studio audience with the original score by Alan Williams, performed by the BBC Philharmonic Orchestra. It was a savvy production for the BBC.